Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. Today, everything is for sale. We're waking up with watches and starting our weekend. Reach out to me, T. Masso, at thewatchbox.com for pricing details, boxes, papers, accessories. And I'm always looking to build inventory. Sell me one watch, trade me a watch. I will buy your entire collection of Platinum Longa. Spoiler alert, Platinum Longa in this show. Buy, trade, or sell. The email address is tmasso at thewatchbox.com. Let's jump straight in with something warm, lovable, and perfectly suited to the colors of late summer and early fall. This is actually the Blancpain 50 Fathoms Bathyscaphe Desert Edition, or as I like to call it, the Desert Eagle. It's a follow-up to the 2018 70s model, and it features the 70s dial with the date aid, as well as the hybrid baton syringe hands, but it's got a little bit of a different gradient to its dial, and you can see the bezel is black rather than the brown of the previous model. It is based on the Bathyscaphe, which means it is the more traditional-looking case between this and the 5015. This is a little bit smaller. You can see it's minimally beveled, squared off at the end of the lugs. The case is simple. The crown has no guards, and it is a big crown profile. It has a wonderfully crisp bezel, which is 120 click, and you can see the dial is nicely layered. There's a chapter ring outboard that features satinated numerals representing the stations of every five seconds or five minutes, and then you can see inboard of that, they're actually polished to applique indices. Those are loom, so we have loom at the top, loom inboard, and then all the way inboard on the three hands. The watch does include a day and a date complication with double quick set, which is wonderfully convenient. If you note, turning clockwise adjusts both, and turning counterclockwise adjusts just the day. Very practical. Still 300 meters water resistant. You can see it features a wonderfully bright gradient, as it really is a lovely golden brown at its edge and almost bright beige silver at its center. There's a lot of dynamism to this dial. Moser does know better. Turning it all over, we have the caliber 1315 DD for day date. It's anti-magnetic. You can see this is an individually numbered edition of 500 pieces, just like the 70s before it. It has three barrels, a 120 hour power reserve. It's free sprung with an anti-magnetic silicon hairspring. It has three mainspring barrels and of course it has stop seconds in the double quick set. All of the features you expect on a modern high-grade movement, but there's more. Six position adjustment, not five, not four, not three, six. One more than a standard chronometer. 37 jewels and beautifully finished. My favorite feature is being the mile-wide anglage on the edge of every bridge. Seriously, if you're going to buy a Valley du Jeu sports watch and you're comparing this to something like an Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Offshore Diver, the finish is better on the Blancpain side of the fence. Let's throw it on my wrist real quick so you get a sense of it. It's a broad watch, just about 50 millimeters from lug to lug, but you can see that I wear it nicely enough, and I would say if your wrist is 15 centimeters circumference or larger, you're going to wear this watch well. Again, my wrist is 16. Taking a quick look at what AP does best, a more traditionally sized Royal Oak here. We have a model launched in 2012. This is the reference 15450ST with ruthenium. Grand Tapisserie dial. It is the large hobnail, but not the huge hobnail. The huge is the mega on the offshore. That one is stamped. The petite and the grand are both cut with a pantograph, which is why you can see up to 20,000 little indentations on the dial that form the strikes by the mimicry engine that takes a big template of this dial and then etches it in miniature onto what eventually goes into the watch. White gold hands, white gold logo, white gold indices, plenty of loom. You can see that the bolts that hold the bezel in place are white gold, and you can really take note of the difference between the warmth of white gold and the silver white of steel. So this is a 37 millimeter watch, so while it's technically identical to the 15400 and the 15300 before it, it has the 60 hour caliber 3120 automatic movement, it's just a more wearable size, as I find this sub 10 millimeter thick 37 wears a lot like the 39 so if you like the 39 i recommend going for this two millimeters over and the 41 that feels like an offshore two millimeters under the 39 and frankly this feels exactly the same on the wrist partly because the 15 450 is built a little bit more solidly than the more delicate dress oriented jumbo of course the watch is 50 meters water resistant it does have a screw down crown so you can actually surface swim this watch no concerns there uh, it is surface swimmable. It's not a diver, but remember, don't dive 
with it. Don't don't dive with it and don't attempt to swim with a jumbo. There's a big difference between a 50 meter with a screw down crown and the jumbo with its 50 meter and push down crown. The movement's nicely done. You have the coats of arms of Audemars and Piguet on the rotor reminding you that AP is the oldest continuously family owned and run watchmaker in Switzerland. And you can see it features a lovely batwing style full balance bridge with a free sprung Jaramax style index and Jaramax balance wheel. And these things make it very tough and also easy to adjust precisely. 21 six beat rate and one of the features that I love that came out in 2012, AP finally started matching the disc of the date to the color of the dial. Now let's say you want a better deal and you want more functionality. Well in 2006, Vacheron gave us the first Overseas dual time, and that's what we have right here, part of the second generation of the overseas collection. The watch is 42 millimeters in stainless steel and surprisingly only about 12.6 millimeters thick, so it's slender in a way I would not have expected from an automatic, anti-magnetic, highly water-resistant complication. The timepiece is gorgeous, and as you can see, it's got a silver dial with blackened hands as well as white gold indices. They actually improve the contrast. It's a little bit easier to read the silver dial. It's silver white to be precise. It's a little bit easier to read this than some of the darker dials. It uses a JLC 939 base doing business as the Vacheron 1222, and that's a long established tradition as Vacherons have used Lecoultre and Jaeger Lecoultre movements dating back to the 19th century. The watch is 150 meters water resistant, wears well on a small wrist. One of the reasons for that being that this second generation watch has a bracelet you can pull straight down. If this were the third generation or the first generation, the bracelet would want to fight and flare and, and it, this doesn't do that. You can pull it straight down if you do have that smaller wrist. One of the features I love about this bracelet compared to the third generation is that it feels a little bit more solid. The detailing is a little bit more beautiful under the loop. And of course, with every contemporary generation two and three overseas bracelet, the full bracelet, every single link is removable. So you can really size it precisely. On the reverse of the case, we have the image of the Italian naval training vessel, Amerigo Vespucci, which lends its handsome profile to the case back. It's considered to be one of the most beautiful full-rigged, square-rigged ships in the world. Now you can see we have concentric satin finish outboard, a lapping machine, radial grain, polishing, and then also chiseling around the ship. So there's four different finishes on this case back. And underneath that, a soft iron inner cage, much like a Milgauss, that allows the watch to be both... 150 meters water resistant thanks to the case design and 25,000 ampere per meter anti-magnetic. There's a power reserve indicator and you can see we have a radial date which uses a little push adjuster. This is actually a wonderful system because the JLC version of this requires you to actually index a little dimple pusher and the JLC is nowhere near as water resistant. Now we also have a second time zone that I can adjust independently. You can see how there's a little day night indicator adjacent to it. And then if I want to wind the watch right up to its 40 hour maximum power reserve, you can see as I wind it, the power reserve indicator soars towards roughly the 11 o'clock index. A really good looking watch and surprisingly well loomed for a timepiece that hails from Vacheron, the ultimate dress watch specialist. It really is quite legible thanks to the blackened indices by day and then the abundance of loom by night. Now I mentioned the Overseas Generation 1, and here I have an extraordinary version of it. We rarely see the reference 42052, the 35 millimeter Overseas 1, and that's exactly what we have right here, a lovely blue metallic dial with original tritium. You can see this is the Overseas Generation 1. Here's that here's that flare and fight I talked about. It's actually fine for a smaller wrist just because it's not a very big watch to begin with. At 35 millimeters with a little bit of a fight and flare to the bracelet. I'm going to say this wears a little bit like, eh, frankly, a 37 or a 38. I'm going to throw it on my wrist, give you a sense of it. It's a wonderful watch because, to me, the first generation overseas featured the best integration of bracelet and case, but also the most details within and without the bracelet. It is beautifully faceted, polished, satinated, and articulated. And although I have a 16 centimeter circumference wrist, I can absolutely wear this watch. A smaller wrist down to 13 and a half centimeters circumference is really going to enjoy this watch. And one of the best features of it is that despite being only 8.6 millimeters thick, it is still highly water resistant, still 
150 meters, just like the Generation 2 and Generation 3 versions of the watch, a feature that would not again be featured on the overseas, a refinement in the form of a chronometer certification. So it's a Girard Perigo movement modified and regulated by Vacheron inside. So you're getting high horology inside, high horology outside, a really, really special piece. And in case you're wondering, this is all yellow gold. It has a little bit of a pink gold vibe under the lights, but this is yellow gold with a blue metallic dial and very, very special. At a more accessible price point, we have one of the best watches of 2021. This is the 41.5 millimeter Oris Aquas Date Caliber 400. Now, the first Caliber 400 Aquas was a 43.5, which was fine. It wears small for its size, but 41.5 really puts this right in the wheelhouse of your mainstream Seamaster Diver 300s and Rolex Submariners. And while it might be heresy to compare this to a Submariner, let's just run the bare numbers. Rolex Submariner, three-day power reserve, Oris Aquas Date, five-day power reserve. Rolex Submariner, five-year warranty. Oris Aqua State, 10-year warranty. Rolex Submariner, five-year service intervals. Oris, 10-year service intervals. And resistant to 2,250 gauss, that is far more than middle gauss. It's 300 meters water resistant. It features a very de rigueur gradient dial, so it's got a few may fade from gray at the center to almost black at the edge. And applique indices, despite being a $3,500 watch new, you also get wonderfully crisp 120 click bezel that you can line up easily with the minute hand. You have wonderful depth to the dial thanks to the appliques. There is a ceramic insert within the bezel and the watch includes a quick release system. So let me see if I can dig my nails in. There you go. Just like that. You open the quick release and it releases the bracelet. There is, of course, a strap that comes with the watch, and you can swap between them without tools. When it's closed, it's as secure as any screw and bar fixed system. So it gives you the best of both worlds, the security of a screw and bar, as well as the quick release system. And I'm shocked to see a sub $4,000 diver with screw fixed removable links rather than pin sleeves. Uh, Patek on the 34,000 $810 Nautilus gives you pin sleeves fixing removable links, and you get a fold-out dive extension with three different anchoring points inside the clasp, so there's a lot of value here. The movement is nicely executed, two barrels, Oris's exclusive silicon escapement. You can see it uses a fascinating micrometric rack and pinion regulator, plus Etichron, so you can really adjust it quite precisely. Oris boldly promises no worse than minus three plus five seconds per day. And as you can see, this watch is suitable for a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference. This really is the best dive watch of the year, if not the best model of the year. Come on, high horology, 10 years is the new service and warranty standard. Get with it, Oris is already there. Now here's a historic piece. Speaking of already there, this was a world premiere when it debuted back in 1989, and it was a bit of an anthology of Swiss watchmaking greats. So this is the Harry Winston by Retrograde Perpetual Calendar, the 1989 model, 38 millimeters in platinum ultra white. It featured a design by Jean-Claude Guet, who is the father, or was the father, of Emmanuel Guet. Jean-Claude was a longtime watch and jewelry designer, and his son Emmanuel would later go on to design, amongst others, the Audemars became millinery and Royal Oak offshore, so it runs in the family. Get formed the basic notion of what a Harry Winston watch should look like, featuring the motif of the arcs all over the watch, referencing the New York City flagship store of Harry Winston. Roger Dubuis, yes, that Roger Dubuis, and Jean-Marc Viderecht of Agenor combined on the bi-retrograde perpetual calendar system. So you get Jean-Claude Get's design, you get Roger Dubuis, and you get Jean-Marc Viderecht of Agenor, and of course Agenor, among many high-profile commissions, has actually later built a watch in the Harry Winston Opus series. Well, this was the first true high horology Harry Winston watch, and you can see it's a beautiful piece. It's thin in profile. It has double articulation, so you actually have a pivot of the strap inside the lugs, but then the lugs themselves pivot. You can see a simple, solid platinum case back. And the dial has a lovely vertical stainless steel-like striation with beveling about the flanks of the retrograde day and date. We have a leap year phase indicator. We have a moon phase, which you can see is set on a little lapis base, quite beautiful. This is a very special watch and a real pioneer. As prior to this timepiece, there had never been a bi-retrograde perpetual calendar wristwatch. This was the first, and the people associated with it mean it is an all-time great and a truly important historical piece.
Here's a watch you might not remember, but it was a GPHG Laureate back in 2004. It actually won the Poisson de Genève Award at the GPHG in 2004, which it held jointly with the Patek Fleet 5135 annual calendar. So this is the Zenith Chronomaster Open El Primero. 40 4.5, 45, 44.5, uh, depending on how you measure it. It is a large watch, and the timepiece all in steel has a lovely manner of breaking up its mass. As you can see, the triple Gadron domed bezel, one, two, three domed flanks, fluting about the lugs, a lovely ruthenium dial with black polished power reserve scale Dauphine hands with a lovely sword-like extension, and then applique rhodium-plated steel radially arrayed Roman numerals. Terry Natoff is a controversial guy, and for better or worse, he was the dominant figure in Zenith watch design during the 2000s. This was undoubtedly his magnum opus. It was his great work, the watch that everyone copied, and the watch, which in several forms, remains a big part of the Zenith aesthetic, the open dial, the visible movement. This watch features a special El Primero caliber 4021 that has evacuated bridges. So you can see the fourth wheel, which has an extended pinion attached to a tri-spoke seconds hand. You can see the escape wheel, the anchor, and then the balance and the hairspring. And all of that is visible on the dial side thanks to those evacuated, carved out bridges. It gives you 90% of the fun of a tourbillon for 10% of the price, maybe less. Now the watch does have a 52 hour automatic winding power reserve and a wonderfully crisp column wheel El Primero movement. Of course, the El Primero beating way at 10 beats per second since 1969, the original automatic integrated high beat chronograph caliber. And it's still a great looking one as the lateral clutch and the column wheel are beautifully visible and flies away at 36,000 vibrations per hour. So it has a lovely double step cadence against the ear. Let's throw this one on my wrist. It's a big watch, but I could wear it. This watch with black dial was actually one of the timepieces that helped to get me into watches, seriously into watches, not as a dabbler or as a fan, but as an inveterate devotee and obsessive. And it was the black dial version of this watch at a tourneau in the used watch case that led me to think, wow, you'd really have to do something special in your life to deserve a watch like that. And I still think of this watch as just carrying a great sense of occasion, a real showpiece watch that you can get from a great brand with a great design and a great movement for comparatively little money and beautifully made with no corners cut, solid lugs, no more pin pinholes. Terry Natoff got rid of those. Deployant clasps, no more pin buckle clasps in this era. This is a very deluxe watch and probably the best of 2000s era Zenith design, certainly the most enduring. Now, here are two watches that technically both hail from what I call the Luxury 3. I always say Omega, Rolex, and Breitling are the Luxury 3. And while the Breitling brand may have taken some knocks in the last few years, I always consider them to be comparable, at least in their market price range. Uh, now, of course, something like this sort of breaks the mold because we're no longer talking about an Oyster Perpetual or a Datejust or an Air King or a Milgau. So we're talking about a very deluxe flagship piece. Of course, this is the Rolex Date 8 II, 41 millimeters blazon with brilliant cut gems. All of this is factory. And you can see that the watch is white gold. It is the 218349. It has a Surtee style dial with baguette diamonds and baguette sapphires. It is a very special watch. Broad, commanding. I have to say, of all of the presidents, so the so called presidential Rolex watches, this one has the most impact. Now, I'm not sure that this is necessarily a watch for an actual president, maybe a president for life, if you catch my drift, uh, or a Middle Eastern potentate. Again, just to let everyone know who's top dog in the Seven Emirates while you're shopping at the Dubai Mall, this watch definitely has that going. But let us not forget that we Americans also love the bling style down in Miami Beach, LA's Sunset Strip, and though they won't admit it, New York City and Chicago. This is a very cool piece. A lot of finery and significantly the diamond and gem set Rolex watches are the only ones that are still hand finished. Everything else can be achieved mechanically by automated process. The gem setting is still manual, meaning that these are the last truly handmade Rolex watches. It's thin, it's broad. It's actually about 53 millimeters from end link to end link, so it has the wrist presence of a 43 millimeter watch. Now, if you want a great deal, this is a great way to get into the Luxury 3 again, Omega, Rolex, and Breitling, from a very different place than the Date 8 II we just saw. Of course, this is the Super Ocean 42. Uh, the watch right here, as you can see, features a stamp inside the bracelet, and I'll show you what 
that says. So 2307, that means the 23rd week of 2007. Generally, the bracelets are made around the same time as the case, so I have no doubt that the code between the lugs also codes for a period in 2007. Now, this watch offers a lot. It's a chronometer. It's a 1,500-meter diver. It includes a helium escape valve, an iridescent blue dial just this side of a Milgauss Z Blue, very similar to the iridescent blue from the Omega Seamaster Diver 300s of the early 2000s. It has a wonderful 120-click bezel, and it's a captive bezel held on by screws. This is how Zinn builds its bezel. In fact, you can actually see, here's my Zinn right here. You can see the screws fixing the bezel to the case. This prevents the bezel from getting knocked off by impact. Uh, so it is a very durable system, super secure. And then inside, we have basically an ETA 28242, which is a chronometer-grade automatic. Just a lot of capability with this watch. The kind of depth rating and helium escape valve solidity and stature you might expect from something like a Rolex Sea Dweller, so I don't compare this to a Day Day 2 in white gold with gems. I definitely say that if you want bang for your buck in the dive watch class, don't worry about Sea Dwellers, go for this. The watch is wearable. As you can see from lug to lug, it's not too broad. So while a lot of Breitlings from the 2000s were huge, this one almost qualifies as a midsize. A gorgeous looking watch. Uh, all of the romance is in the dial here, as well as the durability. You can see it has a Pro 2 bracelet, so we've got the slash cut, but all the links are symmetrical in size. Let's do a quick loom shot here. Plenty of loom, absolutely no shortfall. Just a very fine watch, excessively priced, with a durable aesthetic that's going to look just as good 10 years hence. A very special piece, a great way to get into luxury watch collecting. Or it could be your daily driver, so you can spare your Longa or your Patek Philippe when it gets time to get dirty. Now, I don't often feature Coral F. Booker or watches on the show, but I do regard their manufacturer movements. So this is the Monero Peripheral Boutique Edition. It's about 40.6 millimeters, yes, 40.6. And the timepiece features a limited series run. It was a boutique edition of 188 pieces. It's stainless steel and beautifully made with a lovely combination of silver steel case, blue metallic dial, and then rose gold hands and indices. This is a very agreeable use of two-tone on a men's watch. Now, which I really like here is that we have a CFB, Peripheral rotor movement. This is It says A2000, but this is actually the CFB A2050. 55-hour power reserve. As you can see, it has a peripheral rotor, and it features a free-sprung balance. It's very technically impressive. There was a company called THA that was founded by Vianney Halter, F.P. Journ, and Denis Flageolet, and Carl F. Bucher actually bought that company, and that company today is manufacturer Carl F. Bucher, developing movements like the A1000 peripheral and the A2000 peripheral. Just a very special watch in that you get automatic winding and a long power reserve and a nicely finished movement with a handsome architecture inside a slender case and a size at just under 41 millimeters that wears really well. This is a great way to get into a high horology watch for a reasonable price. And with the Bucher brand, you've got a billion dollar company behind the brand name. A Bucher mostly known as a retailer in Switzerland. They are a billion dollar company. They actually own Tourneau these days. But Carl F. Bucher, since 2001, has been their refashioned, reborn in-house watch brand. And this is a great example of what Carl F. Bucher does best. Okay, special things. Well, any tourbillon is special, but a tourbillon 120 meters water resistant, that's super special. This, launched in 2019, is the 50 piece limited edition H Moser and C Pioneer Midnight Blue Tourbillon. It is the Pioneer Flying Tourbillon with Midnight Blue, 42.8 millimeter case made of red gold and DLC black titanium. You've seen Moser's Funky Blue, which is a brighter fume fade. Well, this is a Midnight Blue dial. It's about cobalt, I would say, at center, and then navy, almost black at the edge. What really sets this watch apart, aside from the fact that it's a swimmable tourbillon and well loomed, we may as well do a loom shot. But this watch features a double hairspring solution to gravity. So these were both flat hairsprings, black polished stud holders. It's a flying tourbillon as invented in the 1920s in Germany by Alfred Helwig, and you can see there's no upper bridge to block your view. So you can see that there's one stud holder and then another, 180 degrees apart, the idea being in any orientation with respect to gravity, one of the hairsprings is going to be inclined to beat slower. The other 
which is physically identical and exactly opposite, will speed up, so they cancel each other out, restoring the chronometric intent of the tourbillon from the days of Abraham Louis Briquet. Now, this is a remarkable watch because it's an automatic tourbillon in addition to its other refinements. You can see it's one of 50. It's a limited edition. We have a golden chiton held by black polished screws that holds the barrel arbor. The bottom of the tourbillon is braced by a ceramic ball bearing, and then we have a magic lever-style pole-based winding system. It even includes matching blackened titanium pin buckle, and you can see that the striations of the buckle match the coining of the case flanks. Moser cases are handmade. They are first machined and then hand finished, so you can create these lovely hollows and details. You can see that the lug hoods are satinated, the flanks are polished, and that's something you can't do when you're just mass producing cases by stamping. So these Moser cases are first machined and then hand finished, and the result is aesthetically very pleasing. Now here's a watch that came out in 2019, and I didn't warm up to it immediately. I'm not sure I felt the need for an Aquanaut chronograph in a world where we already had various versions of the 5990 and 5980. But when you put it on a black strap, it looks a little bit less well, rambunctious and becomes a bit more refined. I think orange on a watch is a potent color. It's something like yellow gold that's best used sparingly. So this watch, 42.2 millimeters in stainless steel, makes effective use of orange accents on its dial, and you can see you've got a gradient fume fade here, too, from silver at the center to almost black at the edge. The sub-register, if you look carefully, it's easy to miss at first glance, but you can see the sub-register for the minutes is a 60-minute register, and it has a sort of rounded polygonal form that echoes the form of the bezel, the inner bezel, the crystal, and the dial. So the sub-register for the minutes is actually an echo of the shape of the watch itself. Now, we have applique indices and then inboard those applique Arabic numerals. The watch is a flyback chronograph, so you can reset it and restore it. It's 120 meters water resistant. It's very, very well loomed. No problems there. And one of my favorite features besides the flyback functionality of this chronograph is the fact that you get a 60 minute register. So a lot of chronographs only feature 30 minutes, which is odd because if you have a 12 hour counter on your watch and a 30 minute register, how do you time something between 30 and 60 minutes on a regular chrono? The answer is you don't. I'd, I would spare myself the hour counter for a full 60 minutes on the minute register. Now the watch is nicely made. As you can see, Patek cases for the Steel Sports watches are handsomely faceted, polished, satinated. There's a lot of contrast. It's not as complex in form as, for example, any Nautilus, but it has an agreeable shape and a lot of wrist presence. The movement is a vertical clutch column wheel caliber CH28520, 55 hour power reserve. And while it doesn't actually feature a hacking seconds functionality. Because it's a vertical clutch, you can just leave the chronograph running full time, so you've got a constant seconds animation on the dial. Otherwise, it's fairly dead. Now, if you set the time, you can use the flyback to reset the seconds and, and effectively use that like zero reset seconds. The movement, as you would expect on a Patek, is beautifully finished. Now, the, the basic parts are created using CNC and electrospark erosion, but the finishing touches on a Patek movement will be done by hand, and that's quite different from what you'll find at most Audemars Piguet movement levels, for example. Patek still hand bevels, or at least finishes by hand, all of the engalage in its movements, among many other features that are manual in the Patek. Thinner than you'd expect. It's only 12 millimeters thick, which is about uh, three-tenths of a millimeter thinner than a Daytona, and that I did not expect. You've got to be wondering, what's my last watch when this is the penultimate piece? You know I like to finish on a imperious machine, and I don't know what is more imperious than a 41.9 millimeter platinum 100 piece limited edition Alanga Unzona Longa One Tourbillon Perpetual Calendar. This nearly 42 millimeter platinum limited edition of 100 came out in 2012. It features a lovely gray galvanized dial. The dial is made of sterling silver. The frame for the date, the hands, the indices, the numerals, all of that's white gold. And then the moon phase disc is also made of gold. You can see that there is a radial rotating month. We've got the moon phase coaxial with the seconds hand. We've got a little day indicator. We've got a double digit date, and then we've got a day night indicator so you know when not to attempt to use the setting pushers for the perpetual calendar. Now, I mentioned this is also a tourbillon, and so it is. On the reverse side, 
We have caliber L0821. Lots to love here. First, it's an automatic winder, which is very convenient for a perpetual. It will keep itself wound, provided you wear it. 75 synthetic rubies, but if you look underneath the tourbillon, one real brilliant cut diamond. That's the capstone underneath the tourbillon. Another rare feature, stop seconds or hacking with a tourbillon. That's connected to the seconds hand, so you can actually stop seconds and synchronize to a reference time. The timepiece, of course, features German silver bridges, nickel, copper, zinc, with the copper giving it that golden hue. Not one, but two freehand engraved structures, supplying power to the tourbillon, as well as a little underpinning for the tourbillon. And if you look carefully, you can even see that there are spiral spoke wheels reminiscent of 19th century longa pocket watches. Now the rotor, what an impressive piece. You can see it's black polished at its center, then it's attached to its center rotor structure using black polished pins. You can see this outer rotor is 21 karat gold, it even says so, and it's fixed by fired blued screws to a platinum mass, so it's a double precious metal rotor. All of this with a 55 hour power reserve. And you can see there's engine turning in two sides, and if you look carefully, mirrored on glage, jewels set in gold and chiton, another nod to the pocket watch era, and though the bridges are broken up for easier servicing, the general look is designed to give an impression of a three-quarter bridge as you would find on a vintage Longa pocket watch. Now, it is an impressive thing on the wrist. It's big, though. In platinum, at almost 42 millimeters, it's got a lot of presence, which is why I would say this is a watch for a 15 centimeter circumference wrist or larger. Think Zeitwerk, and you have the basic idea. It's not too thick, though, and it will slide underneath the cuff, a really impressive piece in every regard. A watch that practically demands you buy a loop if you buy the watch. That's just a taste of what you'll get. So, what could possibly upstage that? Well, my favorite new watch of 2018, this is the IWC Tribute to Paul Weber. It is a wristwatch, 500 pieces in stainless steel with a 12-layer hand lacquered dial that is a jumping minute and hour, everything the Zeitwerk is for about one quarter of the price. The hand-finished dial includes 12 layers of blue and clear lacquer, all of it buffed manually to create the look of a 19th century IWC Paul Weber jumping hours, jumping minutes pocket watch. Now, Josef Paul Weber of Austria designed the jumping time system, and in 1885, and for about two model years, IWC built Paul Weber pocket watches, so a little bit more than two model years, 85, 86, 87, and somewhere between 10,000 and 16,000 were made. They're not common today, and they're treasured when they show up, but this watch, in every other regard, is a more impressive timekeeper than those were. This watch, of course, has everything you want in terms of visual fireworks on the dial, but it also has a wire lug profile, a little bit like a radiomere, that means though it's 45 millimeters in diameter, let's watch the jump one more time. See, it has a quick set forward or backwards, so if you just want to keep watching the jump, you, you can basically do it in perpetuity. It's a wonderful piece of theater. So the watch wears really easy. In spite of being a 45, it's really 45 and circular. So it doesn't wear like a 45 millimeter watch. You know, Hublot big bangs and things that are close to the size of this watch in nominal terms are nothing like this watch ergonomically. You can see the case itself comes nowhere near the edge of my wrist. So even if your wrist is 14 centimeters in circumference, you're going to wear this well. It's also fairly thin too. With a domed bezel, it slides easily underneath the cuff. This movement was built just for this watch. Well, it's clearly based in some regards on the 52,000 series movements, it is unique. This is caliber 94200, and what I like to shout out is that there are really two drivetrains. There are two mainspring barrels. It has a 60-hour power reserve. Remember, the original Zeitwerk, right up until 2019, had only a 36-hour power reserve, so this is genuinely impressive considering it has the same type of display. Now, Though it does not need it, it does feature hacking seconds, even though, for the most part, this watch is all about the jumping minutes. It does have hacking seconds. It has a solid rose gold medallion in the reverse side, and you can see this is one out of 500. The movement is enormous and properly sized to fit the case. It's also nicely decorated. Machine finish, to be sure, but it does include real fired blue screws. It uses an overcoil made by hand and a free-sprung regulator, which means, along with the five-position adjustment, it is also a very accurate watch, and that's not always true of jumping hour, jumping minute watches. There's a little coupling system in the middle because the train that drives the seconds is actually separate from the train that drives the minutes. So there's a little pawl-based system in the center that locks them together once a minute so that the train that drives the seconds can trip the minutes. It is a very, very cool watch. And of all the watches I've shared with you in the last couple of weeks, this is probably the one that I want most for my own wrist. It's easily my best in show for today. Remember, reach out to T Masso at 
thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details of anything you see here today. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.